I'd like to start uh, by asking you to contemplate one of the uh, many early 21st century social phenomena that Google has uh, helped to facilitate, uh, and that's the blogosphere, in particular the political blogosphere. And I'd like you to contemplate the following. Um, what, 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 what factors do you think would be more potent, which, which of the following factors would you think would be more potent determinants of the amount of attention that a pundit would attract in the blogosphere? Uh, on the one hand, there is the empirical accuracy of the pundit, uh, the degree to which the pundit um, is able to attach reasonably nuanced and realistic probabilities to possible futures. And on the other hand, you have uh, the degree to which the pundit is passionately partisan and entertainingly sarcastic. <laughs> the right. second one so, you said. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's, not, it's not even a remotely close call, is it? Uh, and that, that, that says something interesting. Now, if you're a 19th century liberal in the spirit of John Stuart Mill, you might say, well, look, the marketplace of ideas is going to equilibrate. It's going to self-correct in the long run. Uh, but of course, in the long run, uh, we were, as, as Keynes said, we're, we're all going to be dead. So it's a question of how, how, how patient you want to be. Uh, the major thrust of my talk is that there's a great value to be had in keeping score. Uh, in systematically monitoring the degree to which pundits and various other self-appointed or other appointed experts uh, actually do have an empirically realistic view of the world. Um, and that really is, I guess, the segue into what I've done. Uh, what I've done uh, over the last 20 years is I've been carrying out a series of studies of political and economic and military and other experts, asking them, essentially, what do you think the future holds? Uh, and defining the futures with sufficient specificity and clarity that we can actually tell who was right or wrong afterward. Uh, and getting them to assign subjective probabilities to those possible futures, and then scoring them. Uh, so this is essentially a story that, about two things. One is, it is possible uh, to monitor the accuracy of even pretty intellectually slippery characters, uh, like political experts say. Uh, and B, uh, you, you, you learn something you would not have otherwise learned. Uh, there are some surprises. And one of the bigger surprises is the very factors that make experts charismatic and attractive and likely to draw attention to themselves in the blogosphere, those factors tend to be inversely related to what makes them uh, empirically accurate. So there's a, a perverse dynamic at work. And the reason I wanted to give this talk at Google is because it's a pitch, essentially. It's not, not a pitch to sell books. It's a pitch, really, that G Google, I think, could serve a useful public good function. Um, I think Google has the credibility and the influence and the visibility uh, to tip the world at least a little bit in the rational direction, in this case, uh, by sponsoring uh, competitions, of uh, competitions that focus on accuracy. So rather than people in the blogosphere competing on how entertaining they can be and how, how, how cleverly they can help you reinforce your partisan prejudices, uh, rather than competing on those dimensions, getting them to co compete more on the dimensions of how nuanced and realistic are they about the world. And I think that would, on balance, be a good thing. Uh, but the research I'm going to talk about today is essentially an illustration that it is possible. It's not a model for how it could be done in the context of uh, an influential company like Google. Uh, so the title, Foxes, Hedgehogs, and Dart-Throwing Monkeys. Uh, the dart-throwing monkey is, of course, uh, a favorite metaphor that The Economist and Wall Street Journal have used for debunking stock pickers. The question, of course, is whether the stock pickers can do better than the dart-throwing monkeys. And, uh, uh, well, in some competitions, the, the, the pickers do a little bit better, but they don't do a lot better. And as for outperforming market averages, forget it. Uh, on aggregate, they don't. Um, my agenda, I'm essentially going to talk about four things. I'm going to describe what I've done in my research. I'm going to describe, uh, for those of you who looked at the exercises that Jennifer circulated, I'm going to... Uh, uh, assist you in some of the self-assessment exercises. Where do you fall on the individual difference dimensions that we assessed in our studies of political and economic forecasters? Um, what did I find about them, about, about the forecasters I studied, roughly 300 over 20 years? And finally, what more general conclusions should we draw? Uh, psychological conclusions about the dynamics of human thought and uh, perhaps more uh, normative or policy conclusions about how we organize societal decision-making. 
Incidentally, it, it's much more interesting, I think, if there's a dialogue. So you shouldn't assume that this is going to be a monologue. You should feel free to ask questions when they arise. I'll, I'll often say things that are not entirely transparent, so you should you know, raise your hand and I'll, I'll, I'll try to address them. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> What did I do? Uh, essentially, I asked a lot of smart people a lot of questions. And I asked them to assign subjective probabilities uh, to possible futures. Um, then I went ahead and I scored the accuracy of the judgments. I also did something else. I gauged the willingness of experts to change their minds when they got it wrong. One of the interesting features of a lot of political and economic forecasting is uh, there's a deep, in, deeply ingrained reluctance to acknowledge mistakes. Uh, you very rarely see that in the blogosphere, and I think you very, even in academia, you don't see it all that often. Um, so, um, I, 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 we, we call that a Bayesian benchmark, the degree to which people change their mind roughly in accord with a Bayesian probability theory. Uh, yeah? Um, if you're going to address this later, feel free to just uh, tell me to go away. But um, the question that uh, I first wonder about this is that when I think about pundits and bloggers and opinion writers, it seems to me they are spending a very small amount of time making predictions about the future. So I wonder about the possibility that you're assessing their accuracy on subjects that they just don't consider very important and don't do very much. Uh, you're 100% you're right that it's not a natural activity for most political pundits to articulate expectations about the future that are testable in any scientific or quasi-scientific sense. And that's part of the problem. Uh, it's, but part of the problem is pinning people down. Um, what, what you will frequently see in the blogosphere is people articulating strong, vague expectations about the future. So if we stay in Iraq, it's going to be a hopeless quagmire. Or if we pursue this particular welfare, welfare reform bill, uh, we're going to have um, an increase in child poverty. Uh, but they're not stated in a way that's really very directly testable. They're not time-framed. They're not quantified. Um, all of the ingredients you would expect to see, for example, in a good performance management system for employees in a cutting edge organization, <laughs> like SMART. You know the acronym SMART? Does that, has that reached Google? Uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, a good performance appraisal system is supposed to be specific, measurable, achievable, results oriented, and time framed. Right? Well, a, a good performance appraisal system for political pundits should, be roughly the same, should have roughly the same qualities. Uh, so this is an effort to change the ground rules. It's not an, I, I'm not, I, I think it's a bad thing that we've been content for as long as we have with um, uh, vague, untestable claims. I, I think it helps to entrench a culture of partisanship and blame, and uh, it, does, it certainly doesn't facilitate anything remotely resembling organizational learning. And then finally, um, another thing I did do, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't totally uh, uh, remorseless. I, 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 want, I did listen to the experts when they complained. When they, when they came back to me and they said, look, you know, you're, the, the, the criteria you're using for judging accuracy are unfair. So for example, if uh, an expert exaggerated the likelihood of finding weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, they might insist, well, you know, yeah, I was wrong, but I made the right mistake. It was a good idea to overestimate the likelihood than to un underestimate it because type 1 and type 2 errors are not symmetrical here. Or the expert might say, well, this, 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 this defense came up more often a few years ago than now. Uh, we haven't found weapons of mass destruction, but just wait. We will. Be a little bit patient. Um, or an expert who predicted the disintegration of Canada a few year, many years ago said, well, you know, yeah, I was wrong, but you know, I was almost right. The second secessionist referendum in Quebec almost succeeded. It was 50.1% of the vote. That's well within the margin of sampling error. Um, so what we kept running into is, is a lot of resistance to our accuracy criteria. So we tweaked our scoring criteria in a variety of ways to address the objections that experts raised. Okay, participants, very briefly, um, there were two major cohorts um, and, and many smaller ad hoc groups as well. Um, but the, 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 two, the two big cohorts were 1988-89 and 92-93. Uh, so one, one big wave of experts we studied, for example, was before the disintegration of the Soviet Union. There still was something resembling the Cold War going on. Um, I am indeed that old. I'm, I'm actually older than that. Um, all, all participants made their living writing and thinking about political and economic trends. That was essentially the litmus test for whether you're an expert or not. So the experts included a lot of people in academia. They included uh, some journalists. They included a fair number of intelligence analysts. They included people who worked for international institutions like the World Bank and the IMF. 
64% had PhDs, virtually all of them had some kind of postgraduate degree, and they had an average of 12.2 years of professional experience. So by virtually all of the standard superficial criteria for qualifying somebody as an expert, virtually all of them qualify. Now the conceptual ingredients for good judgment, um, what, 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 what are the minimum things we have to have in place if, for example, a company like Google were to contemplate seriously the idea of creating competitions in, uh, that focus on accuracy rather than entertainment value or reinforcing partisan prejudices? Um, well, you would need to define possible futures so they pass certain tests. You would need to pass uh, the exclusiveness and exhaustiveness test in order to use subjective probabilities and assess accuracy. You have to have that. Uh, and then also something called the clairvoyance test. And the clairvoyance test means you have to state the possible future sufficiently precisely so that if, say, Jennifer were a genuine clairvoyant and really did have the power of seeing into the future, all she would need to do was just focus her attention a little, little bit, look out into the future, and, and then she could tell me thumbs up or thumbs down as to whether it happened. And she wouldn't have to come back to me and say, oh, what exactly did you mean by uh, populist backlash in Poland? Or what exactly did you mean all of the, va the vague stuff that you typically observe in, in the blogosphere and, and elsewhere. So there, needed, there needs to be a degree of clarity, a degree of precision, to go back to the earlier question, that you don't typically see in the, in the blogosphere. Um, then you get people to place subjective probabilities on each set. So rather than saying, you know, it's likely or possible or what have you, instead of the vague verbal quantifiers of uncertainty that people typically use, we, we were able to induce them to, to translate those into subjective probabilities. And that's a non-trivial thing to do, learning how to use subjective probability scales. And here, here's a sample question. Uh, central government debt will either hold between 35 and 40 percent of GDP or fall, fall below or rise above that range. And that would apply to a long list of possible countries. Uh, but it wouldn't have to be that. It could, it could be predictions about casualties in Iraq, or it could be predictions about where the Nikkei is going to close at the end of this calendar year, and, and so forth. So th to give you a sense for the full range of things we looked at, uh, there were 50 di 59 different nation states on which we elicited predictions, plus uh, transnational entities like the EU, NATO, and WTO. Uh, many different domains, a lot of predictions on economic performance, a lot of predictions on policy priorities, how much governments are going to spend, uh, how much they're going to put into defense, uh, state-owned enterprises or SOEs, uh, the degree to which privatization is going to proceed in an economy, the degree to which there are going to be leadership changes, whether the same people are going to be in power or not, um, whether there are going to be cross-border conflicts, on and on. Uh, and forecasting horizons, uh, we, we had a number of different forecasting horizons. We had shorter term predictions for the faster moving variables like, like stock markets. And we had longer term predictions for uh, things that change much more slowly in the world, like uh, changes in borders or uh, changes in uh, nuclear status, whether, whether a country is or, is or is not a nuclear power. Although that, of course, raises its own set of tricky issues about when you, you qualify a country as, as being a nuclear power. Um, so this is just a rough breakdown of all the forecasts that we elicited. There were 30,000 different forecasts, and they fall into these categories. Experts making predictions in the domain of their expertise. So you'd have experts on Russia making predictions about Russia. Or experts playing the role of dilettantes or trespassers. Um, dilettantes, so you have experts on Russia making predictions about Canada, and experts on Canada making predictions about Russia. Uh, shorter long-term forecasts. Uh, some of the forecasts uh, falling in the geopolitical zone of, of stability, so Western Europe, North America, Japan, others falling in the geopolitical zone of turbulence, uh, uh, virtually all of Africa, large parts of Asia. Um, different domains, government policy, economic performance, national security, and then questions within domains, and then finally subjective probability judgments within, within those categories. So a total of roughly about 30,000 predictions uh, or, and, and close to 90,000 uh, subjective probability judgments, because the subjective probability judgments were typically organized into three possibilities, three possible futures for each question. There's going to be more of something, there's going to be less of something, there's going to be about the same amount of something, and the boundaries are defined precisely. Yeah? Did you consider, I mean, so the earlier question was about the fact that, you know, not a lot of people spend a lot of their time, you know, people spend a lot of their time predicting the future. Uh, it seems like there are other kinds of things they do make claims about that they're actually judged on, specifically statements of beliefs about the current state or the history 
where there where there are disagreements, like you know, such and such a person was or wasn't lying when they said something to us, for example, it's something a lot of political people want to talk about. Do you consider those kind? You know, and oftentimes in the future you find out a more accurate view of that past. Yeah. And you, you're, you're absolutely right. The people in the blogosphere disagree not only about the future, they disagree about the present, and they disagree about the past. And, and a lot of the disagreements about the past hinge on arguments about causation. And those arguments, in turn, hinge on lots of speculative historical counterfactuals about how history would have unfolded if Reagan hadn't been president, would the Cold War have ended just as quickly, or if Clinton hadn't been president, would the economy have, have boomed as much as it did in the 90s? So there, there are lots of disagreements of a, count, of a counterfactual character that are extremely difficult to have accuracy criteria, because because nobody can go back in a time machine and tweak history and see how history would have unfolded in the, alter in the alternative universe. It's just not, it's just not something we can do. Statements that aren't kind of factual about possible other paths, like, you know, was Bill Clinton lying about Monica Lewinsky or something? Things that will eventually come out where you'll actually know the true answer. That's true. That's true. And no, we, we were not looking at questions of that sort. We were looking at questions that, that, that typically had some kind of fairly direct policy relevance and weren't dealing so much with salacious scandals and issues at the moment. We're, we're dealing with more policy wonkish kinds of things. Uh, the only part of your question I take a little bit of issue with is that the people in the blogosphere aren't really making predictions. Uh, I would argue they're doing it constantly. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, do we have a sense of uh, what fraction of, um, let's say, factual claims by pundits and bloggers can be characterized as predictions as opposed to different kinds of factual claims? That's, a, that's, an, that's an interesting question. I, I haven't done a systematic content analysis of the blogosphere to assess what proportion of their claims are value claims, like this is good or bad just in and of itself, as opposed to this is good or bad because X or Y or Z will happen as a result. So, Thank you so much. Uh, Value claims versus factual ones, although that's an important distinction too, but of factual claims, which ones are predictions and which ones are different types of factual claims? No, I have not done that. But I, am, I have an existential certitude that they're doing a lot of predicting. <laughs> There's also implications like if we did this, then that would happen. Conditional predictions, yeah. That mm -hmm. We never did this. That's right. And then, then it becomes counterfactual. We have to go back in our time machine, right, and, and see how history would have unfolded. History doesn't give us control groups. And that's, and that's one of the reasons why uh, the, the arguments over history can be so readily and profoundly politicized. If you want to know whether someone's a liberal or a conservative, for example, just ask them how history would have unfolded in the 1980s without Ronald Reagan, whether the, whether the Cold War would have ended in roughly the same way as it did. If someone's a conservative, they know with existential certainty that uh, the Cold War would not have ended that way. And that if there had been a weak liberal Democrat in power in 1981, uh, the Soviet Union would still be with us today in all likelihood. They, they, they believe that Ronald Reagan's policies played the key role in precipitating the collapse of the Soviet Union. Whereas for a lot of liberals, that's just t total nonsense. They believe that Gorbachev was the result of an internal evolution in the Soviet polity and that um, those are trends that would have unfolded pretty much regardless of who was in the American White House. Yeah? Are your findings available uh, broken down by individuals? Like Never. Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> they're not. They're not broken down by individuals. Uh, one, one of the conditions for getting cooperation here is anonymity. Uh, there's simply no way. I, I mean, I told people right up front, and it's, it's in the book also, I, I really emphasize to them up front, the point of this is not to identify winners and losers. The point of this is to identify, uh, to test some rather abstract psychological and political hypotheses about how styles of reasoning are related to greater or lesser empirical accuracy over the long haul. Right now by uh, ideology? Absolutely. Yeah, we do. We do uh, that, yeah, yes. And, and it doesn't really matter that much if you're a liberal or a conservative in aggregate. I mean, there are certainly issues where liberals are more accurate and certainly issues where conservatives are more accurate. But on ag in aggregate, across the board, ideology is not a very good predictor. And I'll be saying in a minute what is, but we, we, I, it's a long list of things that are not good predictors. <laughs> okay, probability scoring. Well, this is, this is very, very, very simple stuff. Um, this is actually a, a method of assessing the accuracy of judgments that was developed originally by meteorologists. And one of the reasons why meteorologists are among the very best calibrated professionals ever studied by psychologists is that meteorologists got in the habit about 25 or 30 years ago of, of testing themselves and of seeing how well calibrated they are, of making specific subjective probability judgments about possible futures, precipitation and rainfall and all the things that meteorologists are interested in. 
and, get, and, and get, getting feedback, getting quick, clear feedback on whether they're right or wrong. And the process of doing that is the, is the process by which people become well calibrated. Um, it's, just some, it's just something that doesn't occur in the political realm. Um, but the basic idea is that when an event occurs, you score it as a one. When an event doesn't occur, you score it as a zero. And you, you uh, deviate the probabilities against the outcomes. So if you assign a high probability to something that occurs, your probability is going to be close to one, so that's going to reduce the score. Uh, and if you assign uh, low probabilities to things that don't occur, again, that's going to reduce your, your probability score. And low scores tend to be good. Now, there's, a, there are a lot, there's lots of fancy, uh, or not so fancy, depending on your point of view, um, manipulations you can do to this formula, and there are various scores you can derive from it. You can derive scores of um, knowledge, the amount people know about the world. You can derive scores about calibration and discrimination, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, calibration and discrimination are the two major properties of good judgment that I'm, I'm, I'm going to address today. And um, what does it mean? To be well calibrated means you're on this line here. The diagonal represents perfect calibration. That is, there's a perfect correspondence between the subjective probabilities you assign events and the frequency with, the, with which events assigned those probabilities occur. So all those things that you assigned a 0.2 probability to, they occur 0.2% of the time, or 20% of the time. Now, in the case of this particular forecaster, you could say this, this forecaster is a bit of a fence sitter. This is a forecaster who never really says anything other than varying shades of maybe. They say, well, you know, they never go below 0.4 in their probability assessments and never rise above 0.6. So it's a, uh, but they're perfectly calibrated. So this would be an example of someone who's very well calibrated, but isn't very discriminating. They're not doing a very good job attaching higher probabilities to things that happen than to things that don't happen. This is an example of excellent calibration still, but better and pretty good discrimination because now the forecaster is using a much wider range of the probability scale. And then finally, this is what God looks like in, subject, in the subjective probability scoring universe. This is omniscience. This is what you, you, whenever you say there's a zero probability of something occurring, it never occurs. Whenever you say there's a 1.0 probability of something occurring, it always occurs. <clears throat> now, before telling you, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, what's that? It's, it's not possible to have good discrimination for calibration, is it? Um, it's difficult, but it's possible to some, it depends how, where you set your thresholds, but there, there's a tension there, but yeah. There, there, there is, in, in, in practice, there's a bit of a trade-off between calibration and discrimination. So the people who are best calibrated do tend to be a bit, a bit like fence sitters. They're, 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 they're more cautious. Uh, it's, it's relatively rare to have forecasters who achieve both very good calibration and very good discrimination. Nobody really approaches God in this data set. Um, now, Jennifer circulated some exercises that are somewhat similar, at least um, in principle, to the exercises that we asked our forecasters to do. There was a 50-item quiz that asked people questions like, um, uh, Mandarin is the world's most widely spoken language, true or false? And you, from a 50% probability, is, is coin toss confidence. 1.0 is absolute existential certainty. It's right. Um, and uh, in a mortar and pestle, the pestle is the bowl which holds the material. True or false? Again. So you, it goes on and on like this. These, these are pretty tricky questions. And most, it's, it's difficult for people to, to get much more than 55 or 60% right. Uh, and typically, people are about 20% 20, 20 plus overconfident. Uh, on an instrument like this. But it's, it's, one, of the, uh, it's one of the things we used. Um, so how many of you actually did that exercise? Did it, it, maybe this is all, all alien to you. Well, here, here's what I would simply do as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a blurb for the exercise that Jennifer circulated. Uh, if you're interested in how well calibrated or discriminating you are, go ahead and do that exercise. And um, then uh, we, we can talk a little bit about what mathematical operations you'd have to perform to compute your scores, but... Um, Where do we get it? Um, I'll, be, I'll, I'll resend the URLs. Oh, okay. Okay. okay, but it's, 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 it's an instructive exercise, and I, I think it's actually a good thing to get in the mental habit of doing, quite very simply. Um, 
So that, that's one thing with uh, the self-assessment exercise is assessing your calibration and discriminatory power. Uh, there's this other thing called the cognitive reflection test. I understand that Danny Kahneman was here and he gave you the, the bat and the ball question. How many of you remember the bat and the ball question? Uh, the bat and the ball. Uh, I'm sorry? Yes, it's a t you're right. The bat and the ball together cost a dollar ten. The bat costs a, a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? And it's 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 an example of a, of, a, of a very clever test called the cognitive reflection test, in which no matter how smart you are, your first reaction is going to be to get it wrong. <laughs> um, almost everybody get it's a question of whether or not you rein in your first reaction. If you rein in your first reaction, the people who get it right are all the people who reined in their first reaction and went about it analytically. If you, if, you, if you did it the Gladwell way, if you blinked, you get it wrong. <laughs> Simple as that. Actually, the Kahneman-Gladwell, I guess Gladwell also talked here. The Kahneman-Gladwell juxtaposition is an interesting one because Danny Kahneman is a think guy. <laughs> he believes in think, and, and Gladwell is, of course, much more of an advocate of blink. Uh, but they represent quite different perspectives, I think, on what, on what ails human judgment. And I'm much more toward the Kahneman end of that, of that scale. I, I, I think that... Um, a lot of intuitive judgment gets us into serious trouble, especially when you're dealing with very complex societal issues. Another thing that, we, um, that Jennifer circulated was whether you think of yourself as a hedgehog or a fox. How many of you ever have heard the hedgehog-fox metaphor? The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. It comes from a fragment of poetry from the Greek poet Orchilochus 2,500 years ago. Uh, what does it mean? <laughs> What does it mean? Um, well, <laughs> um, it means, it, 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 and in terms of our measurement instruments, the foxes tend to be intellectual opportunists. They don't fall in love with ideas. They're not very ideological. They're very pragmatic. They like irony. <laughs> uh, whereas hedgehogs are people who fall in love with big organizing principles that impose order on the world. So the hedgehog knows one big thing. Uh, so. A, a, you know, a very flattering view of the hedgehog would be Einstein, right, who stuck with his worldview even when it was being undercut by quantum mechanics. He, he really had a firm belief that God doesn't play dice with the cosmos. He, he was a, a very principled and, of course, brilliant hedgehog. Um, so that's another exercise you can, you can engage in if you want to classify yourself as a fox or a hedgehog. Um, there's good news and bad news for hedgehogs and foxes and for people who score high and low on these various tests. Um, so it turns out that if you classify yourself as a fox who is wary of master theories, like the fox knows many things, and if you did really well on the cognitive reflection test, which has these kind of bat and ball kinds of questions in, them, in it, uh, you're going to resemble the best forecasters in this sample. Uh, so people who uh, are not very ideological, who have a certain ironic distance from events, and who analytically rein in their first reactions to things, uh, do better. Uh, that's the good news for, for the analytical foxes. The bad news for them is that even the very best forecasters in our sample weren't very good. Uh, none of the best forecasters did better than uh, time series models, or statistical models. Uh, and uh, very, uh, some of them did better than the monkey, but it was hard for them to beat even the crudest kind of statistical models, like simple extrapolation algorithms, like whatever happened last time, predict it. <laughs> or whatever is, whatever is now, just predict more of the same. Uh, even those very cr crude kinds of models were hard for, for the experts to beat. Um, so that's the good and the bad news for, for people on the fox end of the scale. The bad news and the good news for people at the hedgehog end uh, again, the hedgehogs are the people with the fondness for master theories. Um, and these are the people who do resemble the worst forecasters in my sample. So if you have a cognitive style like Einstein, <laughs> put it in an ironic way, it's a bad sign for your ability to predict things in a messy, complicated social world of the sort that we have here. So the, 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 uh, the desire for, one of the, one of the trump values of science is parsimony. Hedgehogs treat parsimony as a trump value. People who treat parsimony as a trump value get into lots of trouble in these kinds of exercises. Their subjective probability estimates are really substantially further off from those of people who uh, view the world as much more of an exercise in ad hocery. But there is some good news for the hedgehogs, even, in my data. And that is, the hedgehogs had lower batting averages, for sure. 
but they were overrepresented among the Grand Slam home run hitters. They were overrepresented among the people, for example, who predicted the demise of the Soviet Union. Or overrepresented among the people who predicted the phenomenal Chinese growth rates over the last 15 years. Uh, they're overrepresented among people who predicted the rise of Islamic terrorism. Uh, so hedgehog, whenever something out of the blue happens, there is usually a hedgehog standing around pretty close, ready to claim plausible credit for anticipating it. Um, yeah, lots, that, that triggered lots of questions. Uh, in the back? And it's probably all the same one. So uh, <laughs> think through for us the issue of if you have a field of people making a lot of wild predictions, then when unexpected things happen, Exactly. They, 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 there are hedgehogs all over the map. There are Marxist hedgehogs. There are libertarian hedgehogs. There are boomster hedgehogs. There are doomster hedgehogs. They're all over the map. They're, they're higher variance predictions. They make more extreme predictions. So when something extreme happens, there's, there's usually a hedgehog close by. Uh, now what does that mean in terms of the, the dynamic to the blogosphere? Uh, that means the, the, the path to fame, of course, is not assigning realistic probabilities to things that are just marginally different from the status quo. That's not going to get you very far if you want to become famous. What's going to get you famous is predicting the demise of the Soviet Union three or four years in advance. Or being out front predicting Chinese growth rates. Or being out front predicting Islamic terrorism. Wow. That's a, uh, yeah. Is this analogous to the mutual fund manager Yes, I, I, think, I think it has a number of interesting parallels to finance. And, and indeed, some of our dependent variables are financial in nature, are financial markets. So yes, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, yes? Uh, so would you say that hedgehogs generally have more discrimination and foxes more calibration? Let me come to that in a minute. It, it, it turns out the hedgehogs lose on both. <laughs> they lose on both, but, but it's a good question. And it, it, it does, it's somewhat in the spirit of the argument up to this point. Yeah. Um, here, here's what you see with calibration. And here you see higher scores are bad, because higher scores mean there are larger gaps between your subjective probabilities and reality. So the largest scores, where calibration shows, this is called a third order interaction statistically here. This, this, this mean here, when you have people who have extreme, relatively extreme theoretical or political views, who are hedgehogs, who have low scores on the cognitive reflection test, and they're making long-term predictions. The combination of all those things produces the largest gaps from reality uh, by, by a significant margin. Yes? What's your calibration metric? Is that the quadratic score? Yes, that's exactly right. That's right. Yeah, it's a quadratic scoring rule. Um, here you see uh, a, a two. You, you see improving calibration now along the x-axis is one minus your calibration score, and you see improving discrimination along the y-axis. And um, this 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 goes to the question of whether or not well, you know, the the hedgehogs lost on calibration, but maybe they made up for it on discrimination. What you see is. Fox is making short-term predictions. Fox is making long-term predictions. FSLT, FLT, excuse me, FST and FLT, these, these, these two blobs there, um, they, they are, this is the kind of the maximum performance frontier. This is the best calibration discrimination combinations that human beings were getting. Time series models are off the chart. <laughs> they're, they're, they're above where, what, what can be represented here. Uh, simple extrapolation models like 0.35 and 0.36 those represent um, mindless extrapolation algorithms, like predict more of the same or the most recent rate of change. Um, hedgehog short term, hedgehog long term, they're worse on calibration. And you can see that by and large, they're also somewhat worse on discrimination. Sometimes they tie on discrimination. But by and large, they're, 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 they're worse on discrimination as well. They're not as much bad. <laughs> the, the, the gap on discrimination is not as great, but it's, it's still there. Uh, yes? Now, so now what's your discrimination metric? The discrimination measure is essentially a measure of whether you're assigning much higher probabilities to things that occur than to things that don't occur. So it's like the variance of correct answers across probability categories. This is what, what it looks like when you look at the, the full subjective probability scale from 0 to 1. To the, the, to, the extent, to the extent that your calibration curve sticks very close to the diagonal, you're perfectly calibrated. And you can see that the forecasters who are straying the furthest from the calibration curve are hedgehogs making long-term predictions in the domain of their expertise. Again, it's, it, but it's just showing, uh, show, showing it along the full, the full scale. 
So essentially, there are three big risk factors when you're doing subjective probability forecasting. One is you're too quick to make up your mind. That is, you get low scores on the bat and ball kind of test. Um, you're too slow to change your mind. And this, this goes into something about ha having to do with a Bayesian benchmarks for whether you change your mind as much as you should when you discover what actually happened. So you're too slow to change your mind, too quick to make up your mind, too slow to change your mind. And then finally, more generally, you just fall too passionately in love with your pet theories. Uh, and that's gauged by whether or not you're an ideological or theoretical extremist. So the deeper trade-off. If you want reasonably good calibration and reasonably good discrimination over large numbers of predictions in relatively stable environments, you're best off going to the analytical foxes. But if you want, I think, creative contingency planning for sharp breakpoints in history, uh, you should seek a more ideologically balanced portfolio of, um, of hedgehogs. You're going to want boomster hedgehogs and doomster hedgehogs. You're going to want realist and institutionalist hedgehogs. You're going to want a wide range. But you, what you're gonna, if you're going to have all these hedgehogs around, though, you're going to have to have a lot of tolerance for false alarms. And <laughs> now we can just talk. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's a great book called The Wisdom of Crowds. And I'm wondering whether you did any aggregation of all your yeah. expert opinions. And great question. Great analysis. question. Absolutely, we did. And as you would expect, from the fact that the hedgehogs have greater variance. Hedgehogs benefit more from aggregation than foxes do. In fact, when you aggregate all the hedgehogs together, the, ag the accuracy of the average hedgehog is not all that different from the accuracy of the ag average fox, even though the individual hedgehogs are very, very inferior to the individual, fox, uh, individual foxes. So you do get that uh, aggregation paradox uh, at work I'd work here. Um, a little bit. Yeah, we don't get a lot of we don't get a big Sir Wiki style uh, wisdom of the crowd effect, but it's a little bit. Yeah. Um, yes. Any uh, distinct uh, differences uh, by whatever demographic group or category, such as bloggers versus people in academia or TV pundits right. or yeah. columnists? This is a long and tedious list of null hypothesis results. <laughs> the Fox Hedgehog Scale and the Cognitive Reflection Test were the two most powerful individual difference predictors of how well people do in these exercises. If you, want to, if you want to know whether they're liberal or conservative, if you want to know whether they're in academia or in government or in journalism, if you want to know how old they are, if you want to know how prestigious the university they went to is, if you want, if you want to know uh, uh, their, their, whether they have PhDs or not, if you want, there's a long list of things that don't matter. <laughs> There were certainly some opinionated people, but there were, <laughs> there were people who today, some of whom are bloggers, some of whom are, I can say some of whom are bloggers. <laughs> yes? So if you're talking about sort of how to make this happen, et cetera, I guess basically two words come to mind, and that's prediction markets, ah. right? So <laughs> prediction markets yeah. are sort of... I, I, think, I think there's a huge amount of value to prediction markets. In fact, um, I, I'm, I'm old enough to have a son who's a, an assistant professor of finance, and he works on prediction markets. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the idea, idea. And in fact, from my psychological point of view, prediction markets work by forcing people to be more self-critical and fox-like. Because prediction markets have this relentless second-guessing dynamic. There's always somebody ready to pounce and, 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 and capitalize on your stupidity. And it forces you to engage in a much more thorough kind of introspection than you, other, than you normally would. So there's a, prediction markets make people smarter, I think, than they otherwise would be. And I think it's quite consistent with these results. Um, I don't think prediction markets serve the kind of public good function that I'm talking about here, though. I think, so, I'm so sorry. So a friend of mine has a project called Proof Markets. And the idea is you have prediction markets in claims that experts and walks have made. And then you sort of automatically form bond funds based on like published things where somebody's made a claim about these various things. See how individuals perform in all these markets as a way of tracking tracking. Like very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Um, the dynamic I had in mind was one in which um, a powerful institution like Google could tip the incentives just a little. I, I think the incentives are so skewed right now toward being entertaining and toward being partisan and shrill. I think, the, the, there, I, I think even Google is not going to be able to produce a, a, a radical shift. But I think it could edge the world a little bit toward rationality if it uh, 
created systematic competitions in which the participating blogs could be ranked by the accuracy of their, of their, of their performance. And it wouldn't all have to be politics. I mean, you, 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 well, like obviously there are a lot, a lot of functions in finance and economics and politics, but in sports or in, in, any, any other domain of life. Yep. So I, I'm slightly doubtful about that because uh, financial magazines have been doing that for years. Mm -hmm. They actually get a dozen of uh, well-reputed experts to write down their prediction, and at the end of the year, they actually rate them. And that does not really seem to have made that much of a dent in what, because people are also looking for entertainment. Yeah, no, no absolutely. And, and in, index funds are boring. <laughs> your model. Yeah. So yeah. the incentive for disregarding this guy is boring, but he, he gets it right, yeah. uh, is is very strong in politics. Well, sometimes you will you will have a direct interest, but mostly it's like uh, big questions, huge questions will never really be solved. Yeah. Really... Yeah. Have you guys ever been visited by the former chairman of the Vanguard Fund? Bogle? John Bogle? Um, he, um, he, I, think he, he, I think he's bald now, but he may have torn out his hair over the years, <laughs> had exactly this phenomenon, how, how slow people were to realize uh, that, they, that even though they were paying large transaction costs to go for these, these the, the, the in, individual advisors, they weren't getting much on, on average for their money. Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, index funds have grown a lot in popularity. I, it's, not, it's not clear there's been no effect as a result of doing this. I think, I think there probably has been. It, has, it, has, it put people, has, it, has it put big individual advisors out of business? Clearly not. Uh, they still make very, very attractive livings. Uh, but has there, has there been a palpable shift I would argue that I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I would be, I, it's quite possible there has been. The problems in finance are very different. I mean, index funds work as long as there's people spending a lot of money by not using index funds. So it's. I understand, there's a, there's a potential paradox there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so the, the, yeah. So the, the, the ideal solution would be for the good judge to, move, to go into index funds and let other people do all the hard cognitive work of making the market sufficient in a, a free rider kind of problem. Yeah. Um, at the very back. Were yeah. hedgehogs born or made? Ah, that's a wonderful question to ask a psychologist like me. Uh, <laughs> that's the old nature nurture question. And, and the answer is both. Uh, there, there is some evidence that cognitive style is heritable and that um, people do vary systematically in their tolerance for ambiguity. Some people really prefer sharp, logical clarity and really dislike ambiguity um, from, an, from a pretty early age on. And it doesn't, it, 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 it seems to be, core, it, 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 identical twin studies and so forth suggest there is some, some genetic component to it. Uh, on the other hand, I think it can be learned too. Uh, so, it's, it's a mixture. If you, you want me to estimate the relative effect sizes, I don't think psychology is quite that precise a science, uh, but it would probably be 30%, uh, 30%, and that adds up to 60%, and it adds up to 60% because the other 40% is measurement noise. <laughs> psychology is very, very messy. <laughs> yeah. You said earlier that ideology was correlated with accuracy based on certain topics. More about that. Oh sure, sure. Uh, there, there, there are lots of topics where, um, I mean, liberals clearly have done better than conservatives on the war in Iraq. Um, liberals did better than conservatives in predicting that major liberalization would occur could could occur in the Soviet Union. A lot of a lot of conservatives were on record in the in the 1984 maintaining that um, that that was extremely unlikely. The Soviet Union was a, an infallibly self-reproducing totalitarian system. It wouldn't happen. Gene Kirkpatrick and Rich, Richard Pipes and people like that were very, 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 very clear on that point. Um, but you know, the conservatives won later on because the conservatives argued, well, if Gorbachev is really serious and he's actually liberalizing this system, this system has no legitimacy. So if he's really liberalizing, the system has to fall apart. Whereas there are many liberals who felt that, this, that Gorbachev could succeed in maintaining the, the Soviet Union. Um, so conservatives went out ahead on that one. Um, conservatives have done somewhat better on the welfare, welfare reform bill of 1996. Uh, there, there's, there are a lot of, it, it's, it's a give and take kind of thing. Uh, it, you know the Andy Warhol expression, everybody gets their 15 minutes of fame? Right, well, every, it, that's, that's true here too. <laughs> every, every point of view, I think, gets, 
get some portion of fame. But is there anything like uh, that causes, say, conservatives to be more pop like for certain topics versus hedgehog like? Yes, yes. Um, there is a pressure to become more fox like when you're in power. Um, yeah. Responsibility and accountability tend to make you more fox like. When you when you're on the out when you when you're on the, when you're on the outside looking in, it's easy to be demagogic. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Is there a correlation between age and fox versus hedgehogs? Not really, no. Uh, you, they, they come young and old. <laughs> Yes? Uh, so, is there a way to objectively uh, judge whether someone is a fox or a hedgehog, or is that a piece of subjectivity that came into the study? I think Jennifer circulated that too. <laughs> That's one, another one of the exercises you, can, you, you, could, you could do if you were interested in doing it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes? Are people foxes in one domain, hedgehogs in another? That's certainly possible. Absolutely. But there's an overwhelming personality style that dominates. No, there, there certainly are some people who are extreme, uh, but it, it, there are many people who are, it's more of a checkerboard. There, there are some domains of life where they're more tolerant of ambiguity, other domains where there are less. There's certainly variants. What I'm talking about when I talk about individual differences, I'm talking about an aggregation across domains. Uh, but there certainly is noise, and, uh, I mean variants, and it's uh, not just noise, although some of it is systematic variance across issues. In fact, there are, there are models in psychology that predict when particular issue domains are likely to evoke more flexible, multi-dimensional thought. Yeah. yeah. Did you consider other accuracy measures besides that one? And does that one have a sort of particular rationale other than the meteorologists use it? So the standard, <laughs> the standard one that's used in computer science, in most statistical model evaluation, um, and in data compression is cross-entropy. And that would, you know, when you're predicting the probability of something and there's, you can measure the frequency, that's sort of the, the sort of optimal theoretical way to do what I would expect. Now, I don't imagine the result can change that much, but it's seems mm -hmm. interesting to reinterpret those. Uh, that's interesting. Um, I, probably something worth talking about later. Is that, so that's, this, that's, this is essentially the, the metric that if you're forced to bet all of like if you're at a horse race and you're forced to bet all of your money and just distribute it in a distribution over the different horses, right. then that's the metric that sort of optimizes, you know, measures how well you can Okay. I, they, would, they would be close, but maybe not identical. Uh, they'll they'll differ. Really like the, the, prop, the, the property that that metric has is that if you assign probability one to something and it doesn't happen, or probably zero to something and it does happen, you lose infinite. Okay. You lose what? You lose infinite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probabilities of zero and one are very problematic uh, from a Bayesian point of view, also, because in principle, you're not supposed to change your mind. It's it's like it's like an absolute. It's an affirmation of absolute religious faith. Like, what would it take to convince Osama bin Laden he's wrong about Allah? <laughs> it's one of those things. Just unthinkable. Um, and we, we had we had to do some little statistical. We, we had we had to move scores out of zero and one to 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 make to make certain things work. Um, but hedgehogs, interestingly, are significantly more likely to use zeros and ones on the probability scale. I say they're more extreme. They're more extreme by a factor of about two. Um, they're basically saying something's absolutely certain or something's absolutely impossible. And, and largely, that's probably because they don't, they're just saying it, right? It, it makes for a better readership if they claim it extremely, and right. they're not really betting actual money or anything on it. Right, yeah, if they're putting, yeah, okay, that, well, that, that's, the, that's the prediction market issue, right? And then that, that's, that, yeah. Yep. Well, in your survey, talking to people, were there any incentives for them to get it right or wrong? Just their pride. But they were all anonymous. They're all anonymous, right? Yeah. Which which makes some of the defenses they invoke later all, some somewhat unusual. For example, I made the right mistake is an unusual mistake. Uh, that might, that might make sense if you're offering advice to a policymaker at a given moment, but when you're talking in an anonymous interview, it's, it, what it suggests is that people conflate probability judgments and values quite routinely. Uh, and that there's actually a lot of psychological evidence for that as well. When, when, when people are attaching a probability judgment to something, not just making a probability judgment, they're, they're, they're infusing it with a lot of evaluative significance. Um, and people have a hard time teasing those things apart. That's another reason why these exercises, these calibration exercises, are useful. You get in the mental habit of um, being more thoughtful about how you quantify uncertainty. Okay, 
Okay, well, uh, are there are any more questions? I will go ahead and recirculate all the exercises that Phil kept referencing. I will send it to Miss MV, so if you filter that into Deb and all, um, <laughs> ask one of your friends who doesn't. Um, and I think there are copies of the book over there, so thanks very much, Phil.